Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome back to our August rendition of the SE Community Conversation Series. My name is Ami Lee. I'm the Director of Public Health Initiatives for SE International, Somatic Experiencing International. And it's my delight, pleasure, honor, and joy to be back with you guys again. I love that this series gets to happen live. It's less time we get to spend together learning and experiencing and growing in ways to be stronger and brighter and just more resourced, more resourced in these times. It's unique times in human history, these hard times in human history, and these opportune times in human history to really take stock of what are our interior resources of strength and capacity that are supporting us enduring through this kind of a moment. That said, welcome, welcome, welcome. So here's how these things usually go. Each month we gather with some topic relative to public health in the world. We are, we are really bringing to light that the modality the Institute is a training facility for um, and an advocate for is neurobiologically based mental health resource called somatic experiencing. The, the incredible offering for our life and times from Dr. Peter Levine. Many of you are familiar with his books and his programs. He's on all the conferences these days. I'd encourage you whenever you get the chance to check out Dr. Levine's work uh, in whatever format is good for you that you do. If you're not already familiar with somatic experiencing, you'll learn a little bit about uh, what some of us are very passionate about. Those of you who are not at all familiar with somatic experiencing, don't worry, that's not a condition or requirement for being here. It's just some of the training that these folks have done so that we can provide you content that is resources for these times rooted in this neurobiological understanding of how the body is impacted by trauma, stores trauma, and can also heal and resolve uh, trauma. So that said, today's series will be on moving through trauma, how fitness can deliberately heal us. We know these are really intense times and many of us are experiencing profound amounts of stress, anxiety, and grief. So hopefully in the next hour and a half together, we may actually not just take in information, about how to work through that, how to deliberately, intentionally let movement heal us, but we may actually experience in this time together, we may experience something that is transformative and leaves you a little better than we found you today. Does that sound good? Okay, so how do we do that? How do we get a little better than we started today by the time we wrap up today? Well, one, I wanna invite you to really bring your participation and your curiosity to our time together. I'd love it if you start thinking right now, what kind of questions do I have? Before I even hear from these panelists, before I even know what they're about or what they have to say, what questions do I have about movement as it relates to trauma? And begin thinking about them. And maybe as you start hearing from the folks who are joining us today, you're going to love them, by the way, this is another amazing set. I'm always blown away. Um, as you start hearing from them, you'll get a little bit more primed on what you want to ask. But the people who are joining us today are some really extraordinary panelists. They are people who took the training, who are not therapists or necessarily one-on-one -on -one coaches, although they may be available for some kind of one-on-one -on -one work, they actually came from more of a larger scale fitness orientation, working with the body in different, different ways. Um, I want to tell you their bios because they're cool, but instead I'm going to ask you guys, panelists, can you go ahead and turn on your videos and turn off your mute and come online with us so everybody can get to know you and hear you a little bit. Cool. There they are. Awesome. Okay. We have Margaret, Dr. Alice, and Lauren all joining us. And rather than me like introducing your field, I would love for everyone who's with us today to get to know you a little bit and know your field because they're different, but they're so like robust. And, and you've brought this like neurobiologically based resolution method to your world in a really cool way. Uh, so before we even kind of dive into that part, just first question, first question to you. 
You may love it, you may hate it. Here we go. First question is, what is important about fitness as it relates to being a trauma healing modality? I will ask you that. And on this, I'll do it in this order. I'm picking on the screen so it doesn't get weird. Margaret, Dr. Alice, Lauren, how about that? We do that as the order. No, you decide your orders, but if you like that order, go, ah, oh, sorry, I'm confusing things. <laughs> That's what I do, good at that. Um, go ahead and answer that question, but in your answer, embed a little bit about who you are and what your practice is so everyone can start to learn a little bit. Okay, so what's important about fitness as it relates to mental health? And then I'll just jump off the screen so y'all can dialogue among yourselves. I think the most important thing is probably what's lacking in fitness and maybe what brings us all here today. Um, and that is a trauma sensitivity tone and approach to movement. Um, and I guess, I think we're supposed to, I'm terrible at following directions, even though I was a classroom teacher. So I think we're supposed to embed a little bit about our background. And I can just say that somatic experiencing is my foundation really. And I have various kind of careers from there, whether it's being an educator, facilitating mindfulness meditation sessions and mindfulness allowed sessions, and of course, movement. Um, so while they're kind of separate, uh, SE is what holds them together. And um, I'll go ahead and jump in too. I, uh, I honestly really don't like that the word fitness is even, is even in this um, because I feel like there's such, and I love what you said, Lauren, about we are missing this trauma um, facilitated or trauma aware approach to, to really movement. And that's the word I like to use. Um, I'm a doctor of physical therapy. I'm an advanced level somatic experiencing student. So Really, the work that I do now is, is I do a lot of one on one or um, group consultation work or, uh, you know, working with companies, corporations, leading webinars and seminars and things like that. But the, I feel like the movement and the SE pieces are like just so interrelated. And, you know, when I think about my kind of my educational background as a physical therapist, this trauma piece is missing. It's hugely missing. Like we don't talk about what happens after someone gets in a car accident. I mean, we do from a clinical PT perspective, we, we certainly know what we're doing, but there's not this approach of working with the autonomic nervous system to come in there too. And like, how is the trauma continuing to affect this person and other areas of their life? Are they scared to get in a car, for example? And SE really addresses that and it allows us to heal that. So I think, for, you know, from fitness as a kind of the global profession, that piece is, is missing. Um, and I really just prefer the term movement because fitness, yeah, I think it makes people think of like dumbbells or they have to go to the gym or do some kind of program and you could movement, you just move, you get up, you move. Well, thank you both. I, I love both of your answers. Um, I agree. Uh, and I, I also use the word movement a lot as someone who comes from, um, initially a dance background. Uh, I often tell people that I teach movement because if I say dance, um, there's a meet, an immediate sort of like recoiling or, <laughs> you know, like, whoa. Um, and I, I agree this, um, you know, as I said, when we had our, our discussion, what happens when people start moving and sensing and feeling their bodies is these traumatic moments can can come to the surface. And particularly in dance training, we're literally trained to um, inhibit those, you know, responses or, or even painful responses like move through the pain and then, you know, we get a lot of messages that are undermining our, our mental health. And uh, so I, the, the work that I do, I'm a professor of dance. I teach um, body, mind, movement, and I'm a somatic experiencing practitioner. So I sort of blend all of these things. But when I'm wearing my professor of dance hat and I'm in that setting, I have a much better perspective on how to approach the training that I like to call you know, it's a little more anatomically friendly. It's a little bit more um, noticing what's happening for people when they do start moving their body and giving time and space for that. I, 
I love, or do we just keep talking? I know. I'm like, I, we, we've gone over this, but yes. I, lo- I, I love what he said. I'm just going to do it. You can interrupt me. I mean, um, because I think it's really pertinent what you said, Margaret, because I had someone ask this specific question um, to me the other day when I was sharing about this, this panel discussion, she asked, you know, can those trauma things come up when we're moving? And she mentioned that sometimes she'll go for a run and have these really intense things come up and, and wasn't sure really what to do with them. So I, d- I feel like it's really important to, a- to address that and to say like, yes, this can come up and, and maybe even, you know, kick around some ideas of like, what, what can people do when that happens? And also going with that thread on the flip side, there can be big releases that come with movement and how do we work and support the nervous system so that, you know, pleasurable, perhaps spacious release isn't overwhelming and flood the nervous system. And I know I experienced that when working with a woman um, in Pilates doing like froggy movements with the legs and her face turned fuchsia. She didn't look like she was in pain. Um, And I just, you know, kind of had her pause and just, you know, check inwardly and, you know, sense what, you know, what was up. And she just began crying that she didn't even realize there was such attention and gripping and fear, she used the word fear, that that all of a sudden like was released. And so we had to bring elements of Saibam for those of you in the SE training um, to to help process and be with that experience. And for how that looked was just noticing the, uh, the feel of that absence of tension. You know, did it have a shape? Was there movement? Bringing curiosity without expectation or judgment, just sensing fresh, freshly um, what she was aware of and giving time and space for that release to be digested. Often we think of um, SE in the trauma context, which of course it, that makes sense, but also metabolizing and processing and digesting these big releases is important. I was thinking about um, the idea of when things come out with exercise, but also when people like you're, you might notice that you're feeling activated and so you have to get up and move or I need to go out for a run so I can feel better or take a walk or go to the gym. There's something about, um, I'm not sure people always connect that, you know, it's, it's beyond the endorphins that are generated with, with movement. And our bodies are designed to move, our fluids move, our cells move, our muscles, we're made up of so much water, our bones are just, everything is designed to move. And especially now during COVID, so many of us are sitting in our chairs, and <laughs> not allowing ourselves that opportunity to move as much. And so I think, um, you know, a lot of my encounters have been much more intense in terms of people feeling this um, sort of simmering, you know, and like I said, there's, there's so much, um, um, you know, I just think that we're often taught to override our feelings, especially in a, in, in, you know, if I'm in a gym and I feel like I'm going to (laughs) cry, is there permission to do that? You know, how I do it. (laughs) That's just me. I did it in yoga the other day, legs up the wall, and I just like started sobbing and it felt really great. I don't know what that was, but I was like, let's just let it happen. So. Oh, you're not alone. Me too. (laughs) Very much so. And sometimes not even putting language or words to why or meaning. It's just like, oh, this is here to coming up to be released. And yep. Isn't that such a huge gift of our, of like the somatic learning when you start to like, maybe we're all out there trying to like pep talk ourselves. Like, it's okay if I just need to cry, you know? And I think there's like a movement in the world right now that's trying to be okay with that. But when you actually understand how the nervous system works, you recognize it as, oh, this is just a thing. My body wants to do it. Why would I stop it? Like, let me let it do that. So I think there's things we start to understand in this group. It's already really fun getting to know you guys, by the way, this is really neat. There was just a question right off the bat from an anonymous attendee that just struck me like really neat to kind of get into, um, like things that we might kind of take for granted as a knowing, 
and, and where we are now. This person says, there's so much pain I feel. If I move, it will come up to the surface and overwhelm me. So I feel frozen. How do I start small? So I know you like Lauren and the mindfulness, Alice and the PT, Margaret and the dance and the movement. We all talked about that. I wonder if you'd be willing to find a way to even show us, like you could talk to us about it, but even show us how, what's a movement. What does it even mean to start small without being overwhelmed? Is it physical pain that's overwhelming? I don't know if this person, or is it like a, a, emotional pain? Um, I, I'm going to interpret for them since they're anonymous. We can't sure. really get more, but their words say, um, I feel if I move, it will come up to the surface and overwhelm me. So that sounds like it's a more interior thing. And I'm going to say maybe it's an emotional sense of pain. Um, they're not necessarily naming a chronic pain condition or something. Um, there's some other really good questions coming up in the chat. So this is going to be fun. Let me know if you guys, if you want to bring anyone on screen, but that's it. How do I start small? to bring movement in without getting overwhelmed is the question. I, I like the coming back to the idea that we talk about in the somatic experiencing training of titration. And this is something I think in our world where we want things big, we want things fast. We want, you know, we want to do the, the thing that's going to give us the big, huge changing results. And that's really not how our nervous systems work. And especially when we're, we are working with that deep, pain. And honestly, the same could be said for, for a physical pain too. And so this idea of titration, you can think back to chemistry class in, in high school where you have the, the test tube and you put one drop of a substance in, and then you see what happens. And so we're, we're working with the nervous system in the same way. So my advice would be to start very slowly and with very small movements and, and experiment a little bit. And this might be something that it's a really wonderful thing to have help from a practitioner or from a support group um, from an SE, you know, person who can who can help to guide and support this as well. But really start really small, smaller than you even think, and and small, and then kind of watch that drop and see well what happens now. Was it okay that I woke up and you know and, and just moved my arm out a little bit differently? Was it okay that I stood up and you know maybe turned my neck in a new way to take in my room in a way that I don't usually do? What you know, and if that's not okay, okay, we know that was too much. What um, is coming to mind for me also is um, first being with both elements, you know, the, you know, something in you that's wanting to move, something that's in us wanting to move, and something in us that's fearful of movement, it almost has like a protective quality, of, uh, doesn't want us to feel overwhelmed. And just Pausing this may be a, here's where I get into my marbled mix of tricks here with marveling SE and mindfulness together, but just noticing both elements, you know, the wanting and the hesitancy and neither is bad or wrong. Um, they, they're here and welcome. And then kind of gently turning, I find maybe even before moving to this something that's not, uh, not, I forget the exact language of your question, but that is hesitant or worried about feeling overwhelmed. And just acknowledging that that's here and kind of even saying back to it, like, oh, I really hear that, you know, you're worried and not pushing past it. Um, I think to what Margaret was mentioning earlier of how often we override our experiences and kind of push past. And so anytime in my experience, either personally or when working with someone else, there is a hesitancy or, um, I never view that part as being in the way. It's like, oh, let's, excuse me, let's take some time and listen to what it has to say, what it might be worried about, um, what it's not wanting us to feel or experience, and also what it is wanting us to feel and experience before um, kind of jumping into movement, even ever so small movement. I'll just add a couple other thoughts. Thank you both. I love your, your answers. Um, the, the, S, the somatic experiencing theme of just noticing is really important without judgment. So I'm going to support that because often we get all caught up in the why. Why are these feelings come up and what do they mean? And um, the opportunity to just notice and not worry about the meaning is really important. 
sometimes and, and starting small, yes, and sometimes even starting with visualizing it. What if I just imagine lengthening? What is what you know, just imagine what do I notice? And then try a little bit to see if my physical small movements are matching what I might notice in the visualization of it. Also, I like to wonder, do I want to move towards or away? And sometimes moving away is totally legit. And moving towards is totally legit. Like, no, having a little bit of um, permission that there's not one perfect way that's going to fit for everyone and, and know that you're going to find your way and a real simple idea, no matter what body part is, is the idea of expanding and condensing, opening and closing. And it might just be one finger. <laughs> it might be your hands. It might ultimately be your whole body, but it, that movement rather than an, a particular exercise really relates to our biology of breathing and expanding and condensing. So I'll just throw that out there as another suggestion as well. I love that question. Me too. And I, I'd like to say just one more thing to that after listening to both of you and thank you so much. I feel like this is such a great opportunity to learn too. I'm, I'm realizing from, um, from other practitioners. So I really appreciate what you both said. And I think that idea too of, of maybe noticing how are you already moving? Because you're probably doing some movements in your daily life and just, just noticing that, you know, that you already are. Like, what are you, are, what are you doing already that's okay? Um, and kind of notice, not, you know, again, be mindful and notice that like, oh, I'm doing this and it, and it is okay. And, and the overwhelm like isn't here or just whatever is there, let it be there. But I think sometimes we can, get really focused on like what we don't have or what isn't there or what can't happen. And so kind of reversing that script and noticing like, oh, but I, I am doing this and this, you know, feels okay, or it doesn't feel, you know, bad. Uh, I think that's something to note as well. And what you said, um, Dr. Alice, reminds me, of course, of our hardwired negativity bias um, that will often, our attention will be hooked by discomfort or pain or fear, worries, which we know engages the limbic fight, flight, freeze, appease system. And so in noticing what movement we have available to us, we're kind of widening our awareness to um, zoom out instead of that like tight focus on what's wrong or what's um, painful. I'm dealing that with that now with my own neck and shoulder pain. So I am practicing what I preach here and just noticing, oh, well, you know, my legs are okay right now. Like I don't have pain there. And oh, okay, my movement of my breath is, you know, going up and down and out and in. And there's, you know, grippy, tight, pinchy neck and shoulder stuff. You know, just kind of as a way of um, moving out of that limbic hijack, fight, fight, freeze, appease state. Um, promised you panelists that if we didn't have questions, I would pop in with provocative fun things. No need. Go for it. Oh. Q&A is exploding. People are really into this talk. They're really, really in. There's some fun questions. And so I want to kind of queue up. Um, Akansha has a question. Akansha, if I'm sorry if I'm saying your name terribly. Um, nice to meet you for the first time. And would you like to come on screen to ask your question? Because it's currently the top of the stack. And I think it really relates to what you were just saying, Lauren. It's a, you know, it's around some activation and intensity versus um, slow movement. And I, I have a feeling it might be a nice conversation. Um, so I'm looking in the participants section to see if you raised your hand. Um, okay, good. We are going to go ahead and, and bring you over onto the screen with us if you would just unmute and, and, and bring your video online. Um, and I'll just let question. For some reason, my video is not showing. Ah. Like, you guys can hear me at least? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Hi, nice to meet you. Um, so my question has to go with the different types of movement um, that can be helpful with activation or trauma. And I feel like there's a lot of resources around um, 
like yoga and Pilates and slow movement that is supportive, but also one of the moments that um, something faster like running, jumping, or even just like strength training that you found to be helpful. So I'm curious just to know like when um, different kinds of movement support different sorts of activation or trauma. Thank you. I mean, that's a great question. And I don't really have an, as a, well, I'm just gonna answer sort of from my own personal experience and also just from a, a little bit of my educational background. If I understand correctly, you're, at, you're asking for how movement affects when you're more highly activated um, as opposed to things that are sort of bringing your nervous system uh, more in a more grounded way in things like yoga. Um, hope I understood that correctly, but I'm thinking in terms of weightlifting in particular, which I experienced a bit of myself personally, and um, I can't tell you how good it felt to lay on a bench and really push some weights away from me. Um, and it really relates to the kind of boundary work that we do in SE where you can be establishing this boundary and pushing away from yourself and and really you know making your boundaries clear um but there was something for me personally about also having the resistance of the weight and allowing the strength of my body to push and also make really great noises from my body when i did it and you know also the physical sensation in my muscles um and i and I liked that kind of sensation also when I was um, lifting, deadlifting, you know, where you're lifting weight from the floor and really pushing through your legs to do that. Uh, not that I'm recommending weight lifting for this. <laughs> I'm just saying from my personal experience, I really understood how it helped my nervous system at times when I did feel highly activated. I was in a very stressful excuse me, administrative position, which I have left since. Um, and I no longer do the weight training. It seems like it served its purpose for the couple of years that I needed it. I'm happy to um, chime in too with a bit of personal background and combined with studies. And I used to be a long distance runner and I um, had a lot of activation in a global high intensity. Um, and so I thought, okay, running, like, and this is kind of what we did in my family, you know, so it just was like, you know, run. Um, and yeah, that would tire me out, burn some energy, but there was still a lot of activation. You know, it, it was like that activation was still there. I was just now more tired. Um, so for me, I still, um, I found just going slowly um, you know, even if I'm in an activated state of even slowing the movement down, which is, I think, perhaps one of the reasons why slowness is emphasized in the SE training of just bringing the body online to just feel the movement. Margaret was talking about the boundary work and pushing hands and that the slowing down, as far as I understand it and experience it is we're not trying to cap the activation. We're just actually trying to allow it to release in a very slow, titrated way. So it's actually fascinating. And in some ways, I think it's almost a um, paradox. Like the more activated I am, the more slower I need to go um, with movement or just even you know day-to-day -day function. Um, but I really appreciate that question because, um, yeah. It made like, me think about it in a new way. <laughs> I, I love what you just said, Lauren, because I'm going to relate something that I, I learned in my training. And this has really stuck with me and I share it with my um, with my one to one clients because, A, I think it really is dependent on the person and on your nervous system. Like, I think we all know that it kind of goes without without saying, but I, I you know, I'll say it anyway. <laughs> um, and so something my, my teacher, Dr. Abby Blakesley said is like, if we're if we're in this state where, you know, maybe we're running, we're running, we're running, or we're like we're punching a pillow, we're punching a pillow, um, 
and we're, we're getting the, you know, the, we're getting the anger out, but we're, we're not feeling the anger. We're not feeling the activation. We're feeling what it's like to punch a pillow or what it's like to, you know, to go so fast. So again, I really like what Lauren said, where when we, when we slow it down, our body then can actually feel like what's, what's, why is there activation? What's happening? And the why is not so important, but just to actually be able to take it in is important. And to then it can sort of run through its course. Um, and I think strength training, weightlifting, pushing into the floor, even I'm standing right now. Um, so doing like, sometimes I'll have my clients just let's get up and do squats, especially if there's some, some disassociation or it doesn't have to be something as, you know, to clinical as squats, but push your feet into the floor that can also help to just bring your body online. Like if we, you know, if we're kind of disassociating or floaty and that's part of our activation pattern, some, some weight bearing exercise is, is really helpful. Um, so I think it is just very personally dependent, but I agree hundred percent with Lauren. Like we, we have to slow down to, to let our bodies catch up. Our nervous systems move slow. Um, and our brains want to run the show and, you know, unfortunately they don't always do the, the best job works better when we can work, to work with the brain, the body all together. Yeah. And, and to that point, you know, often, um, the brain we're kind of, you know, we can be in a repetitive track, um, and kind of all these preconceived notions, labels, stories, and the body, as we know, it lives in the now is present. Um, so it's kind of tapping into that. Um, you know, I might be angry and frustrated and kind of going into a narrative, but kind of slowly feeling that, you know, what does that feel like in this moment? You know, maybe yesterday that movement of um, pushing hands was what was wanted, but maybe right now it's like this direction, you know, and just kind of honoring and sensing and being with um, in that slowing down and it's great. Lauren, I'll just tag on what you said about our brain. When we allow ourselves to take the time to feel our heart brain and our gut brain and, and let, like, I, I always say, tell that head brain to step off, like <laughs> stop bullying because that's where the override comes from. It's coming from our, this, this. And when we bring it back to our body, our, you know, we can go, oh yeah, I really did know that in my gut, or I really did know that in my heart. I don't know why I didn't listen. Yeah. So thanks for that reminder. I think sometimes too, it's maybe difficult to, to even begin to feel what that is. And I just want to name that and say that that's okay. I, I, I work in my, um, in my practice a lot with sober women and women who are in recovery from alcohol addiction. And sometimes there's been such a disconnect for for so long with the body that, you know, you're like, well, what is, you can ask people what's happening in your body. And I, I do ask all my clients that like probably more than they would like, but I love to bring it back to the body. Um, so if this is something that's difficult for you or you're, you're not, you're listening to this and um, it, that doesn't quite make sense or it's a challenge, just know that that's okay. It, it is. It's not how we've been trained in our society. It's not the way that we're sort of structured to look at the world. So, I mean, this work is so wonderful because it really does bring us home. You know, it brings us back to ourself. And just, again, that concept of titration, little by little, you can start to feel and notice and then really come into to more of that, being able to trust the heart brain and the gut brain and, and allow some of that, that um, integration and tell the bossy, I like that. Stop bossing me, brain. <laughs> yeah, well, and it's interesting because as I'm listening, it's like the bossy brain, it, it's an adaptive strategy, you know, it's an adaptive habit, you know, and often our adaptive strategies and habits are the loudest because they were what was most needed to help us in the environments in which we were raised, whether it was our family, uh, our, our schools, our culture. Um, and so it had to be loud. And that's it had to be our default, even though we may have been overriding what we really wanted. Um, it may have been necessary to go with that override. Uh, so SE I find for myself, um, it's just untangling, <laughs> untangling kind of these adaptive strategies and habits, um, not in uh, with a tone of pushing away or getting rid of, but like just adding additional options into the mix, like and then greater understanding of like, oh, that's why it had to be so loud. Yeah, no wonder. Um, and 
really listening and honoring that as I build the capacity, build new strategies, but always appreciating those adaptive strategies because they got me this far. They got me here. I'm having so much fun. Um, I want to add something in there. And um, Akansha, I know we can't see your video, but if you want to weigh in, if if these questions, if these responses are kind of getting getting where you wanted to go. Um, yeah, yeah, no, thank you. I think I got a lot out of it and the different perspectives of really what you notice when you slow down. And yeah, I think it's, it's very individual and it's gave me a few more things to think about. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Um, well, and I'd like to add, add something in here too, if it's okay, guys, it just, um, you know, the Institute, we're working on a curriculum right now called crisis stabilization and safety CSS. And, um, it, it's, it's interesting. It looks at folks when they're in crisis. So, so SE is this modality for trauma resolution afterwards, but I think any of us who've started to study it are like, wait, prevention, you know, like once you learn about resolution, you're like, how do I get more prevention? How do I actually front load the resilience and the wellness and the capacity pieces? And I think this program we have in development starts to get there. It's almost like a neurobiologically based crisis intervention peer support program. So you'll all be hearing more about this. Consider this me priming the pump. Um, but you can learn more at traumahealing.org slash scope, where at the start of COVID, um, in the U.S., we, we tried to create sort of protocol-based little bite-sized SE exercises. It takes some very deep, complex stuff, and it just makes it a little bit accessible. The idea being, and this all connects to your question, Akansha, it, the idea being that if an ICU nurse needs to go from a bedside to a nurse's station and has, you know, the three minutes in between and is feeling intensely activated, it's probably not the best time for that person to slow down, take a deep breath and do yoga in the back hallway. You know, like we know there are certain moments in life where mobilization are important as part of becoming stable. And sometimes Sometimes that means calming down, but sometimes that just means getting stable and steady. So to your question about when is intense movement, you know, kind of in contrast to slow movement useful, I, I would say it's something about noticing what kind of nervous system activation is present, right? Like if one is in a sort of dorsal shutdown versus a high dorsal freeze, like just a really incapacitated place, it might be worthwhile to explore titrated, like Dr. Alice said, titrated um, ways of, of sort of getting energized back up, getting the sympathetic system back, maybe some short, fast breaths, like a lot of breath work, you know, like <laughs> instead of, oh, calm down, take that breath, you know, we're, then we're not all about that. We're about noticing where the nervous system is at and moving it into what is an optimal state. It's not all about everyone just needs to relax, although we might feel that some days, <laughs> but truthfully, so there's something about Noticing, is it a sympathetic activation I'm working with in a client? Are they agitated and sort of and, and hyper or, or anxious or, or kind of firing rich, is what I say, or are they kind of shut down and, and stuck? And then identifying what might be the thing that moves the needle for them in that particular range to move that forward. So I don't know, that's something that I think the CSS program I explore with you guys. And if any of you work in emergency response or work in crisis intervention, would like to get in touch with us to maybe help contribute to that program or be on a pilot team, please shoot us an email at publichealth@traumahealing.org because I'd love to hear more, if, especially if anybody among you is working with emergency responders, including law enforcement, public safety, fire, and medical. Um, we're developing this a lot with that in mind, although teachers, parents, I mean, there's nobody right now who's not a crisis responder in the country, I think, in the world, we know that. Um, so thanks. Thanks for letting me chime in. And can we roll over to another question, guys? Um, there's one from um, Kath Crum. So a lot of these, I'm going to skip over some that got high votes because they kind of touched on a lot of the things I think you just did. But for a little variety, Kath Crumline. Um, if you would be willing to come on screen with us and ask your question, would you raise your little blue hand and we'll get you over here? Um, or if not, oh, yep, here she comes. All right, we're going to bring her on over. Um, she's got a nice question that's a little bit in contrast to some of the others. I'd be curious. Um, hi, Kath. Go ahead and turn on your video. Good. Hi, Dan. 
Hey, um, so I know that you that you talked a little bit about this in your last response, but I'm really curious about how, if there's anything more that you can say just about activation. You know, sometimes movement comes from a place of compulsivity, you know, being compulsive about feeling the need to move. And, and while I think that you touched on it a little bit, I'm just curious about how sometimes we can pay attention to how the act of movement may not actually be what is needed, you know, in the moment. And, and, and sometimes it is about slowing it down. And sometimes it's really about holding stillness. I'm not sure, like, I don't know if there's another kind of nuance that would be helpful here, but do you, do you understand kind of where I'm coming from? Just understanding that, I mean, I, I did that for a long time, you know, kind of wanting to settle my global high intensity activation and found that exercise actually just kind of increased it. It didn't really help it to move into a different place. And so just with that lens, thank you. I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, I so appreciate the question because it sounds like um, I can, I mean, and that sounds like I can relate. You know, for, I mentioned I was a long distance runner for a number of years and it was like, I felt any smidge of discomfort. It was boom, 10 miles, you know, with, um, and I really, the emotion was undercoupled, right? So we had the behavior or the, like, I have to run, but I was never really, and I thought that was good, but I didn't notice kind of going beneath that something in me is feeling like it needs to run. Okay, you know, might there be an emotion that's present? And uh, you know, for me, it was like, um, well, it could be any number of things, but you could just go with overwhelm or a sense of trap. And this is where I think SE has been um, extraordinarily helpful and supportive in my life of been working with SE practitioners since 2008, and um, I'm now completing my advanced year. I forgot to mention that, but um, in helping me just put that pause in between, okay, feeling the urge or action, be it movement or to the pantry, or you know, just pausing and sensing, okay, and might there be an emotion that's also here, um, and just uh, slowing it down a little so that the the movement is coming from an informed, um, responsive place rather than a reactionary, habitual place. It's what comes to mind. I, I like the idea too, and I think you touched on this, Lauren. Also, Kath, I really want to hear you play like your guitar. <laughs> oh, maybe we could do a little movement with the guitar music. Um, I like the idea of, <laughs> I'll be into it, okay. Um, of noticing the impulse. And I think Lauren, you, you touched on this. Um, is it, you know, cause I'm, I was a habitual exerciser and I can certainly still tend towards that, that way I, I have to check in, you know, but it's, you know, if I just want to run, I want to get away from this, or I have to do this. Like, can I notice that impulse in my body? Can I just stay where I am and notice like, Oh, there's coiling in my legs. Interesting. Or I feel this like fluttery in my, in my gut and it like, and my body is like physically moving like towards the door or towards my sneakers. And, and really just to almost make that like a exploratory, you know, can be a game almost. You can think of it like that of, of just kind of sort of piecing it apart and noticing like, what's happening with this impulse before I just habitually, just like you said, Lauren, habitually I'm out the door. Um, and I, I started, well, never mind. I'll save that. I'll leave it there. Well, over to you, Margaret. <laughs> I don't have a whole lot to add. I think both uh, what you said, Dr. Alice and Lauren are really, really helpful. Um, you know, again, I think visualization is really helpful too. Um, and notice the impulse. And what happens if you just imagine the running or imagine the kickboxing or whatever needs to happen, it, whoever, whatever impulse is coming up, notice in your body and, and, you know, imagine it and then, but be present in your body in the, in the moment. And again, you know, we always say, be curious. <laughs> and I, I think it's one of the best things that we can do is like, what is happening without, uh, without, 
thinking that that there has to be a correct answer. And I also share with people that it's totally okay to be confused. Like, I don't know, I have this impulse, I don't know why I'm going to notice it, and I'm confused by it. And let like, is it okay to just be confused? Like, that's, that's a place to be too. So that's really all I have to add. Um, I think it, it's a really, these questions are really making us think. I love it. <laughs> Thank you, all. I really appreciate the time and attention toward it. Thank you. Would you be, would you be open to playing a little bit of music for us, Kat, since you have your guitar there? Well, sure. I am. Uh, I'm mostly just practicing, you know, some finger picking stuff. So and maybe for anyone else watching, if this moves you to move, just kind of be curious and notice that too. Like, how, do, how does this move make me want to move right now? You can hear that I'm working on a new skill. <laughs> It's beautiful. <laughs> We're working on it with you, sister. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. Good. <laughs> fabulous. Thank you guys for being here today and for offering this resource to us. I appreciate it. Yeah, this is really nice. It, it just made me think with that, Kath, like you guys just talked a lot about like the image channel, having the image of a movement and having some impact. So I, I just really want to put out there a couple of things, which is you know, for many people might be with us or watch this over time or just exist in our worlds who are differently abled in their bodies. And so what I really got out of that last question, thanks Kath, because you put it forward and it had this emerge, um, is that even just the image of the movement, just thinking of a movement starts to put you in a new space. And it doesn't necessarily even have to be physical. As I was just doing this, playing guitar with you, like there's no strings I'm plucking, but I can feel that. And as a result, that sensation is moving through my body in some way not to be dismissed. You know, as little kids, we played air guitar or we played air drums. You know, there was something in uh, just imagining kinds of movement too. It's really powerful. So I want to add in just one other thing on this question. Our, our, the previous gal who was with us, Akansha, also added in from the chat that she used to be an avid runner. And so she's tracking this one too with us. But also she had, she kind of wondered if the compulsion to move or exercise might be coupled with, the, is the word she used, but coming from a sympathetic flight response. So I thought that, there's probably a lot we could say there. Want to explore that a little bit? I mean, Amy, are you asking me to explore that a little bit? Or are you just- Oh, I'm you sorry. Our, our yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. The, you know, Kath, if you just want to <laughs> pull the background, I mean, I'm just keeping you. We're just keeping By you. By the way, somebody asked if it was dust in the wind. It's it's based on that. So it's a finger picking pattern from that, but I'm also just playing with, with chords. And, you know, for me, part of movement that really shifts in my own system is being able to be playful with something rather than trying to get it right. So even playing, I mean, that was kind of a scary activating thing to even play in front of this group. I mean, I'm, I'm just seeing your four faces, but knowing that there was an audience there, it was, um, it was important for me to really just sink into really just being present in the moment and not having it be about the outcome. And I think that that's sometimes for me, what comes up in exercise is that it sometimes tends to be about the outcome rather than me just being present in the moment. So you guys have more to say about that, I'm sure, but um, thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to pop off in terms of video just so that I can settle myself back down again. Thank you, Kath. On that, Kath. OMG. Yeah, I mean, I am happy to speak um, a little bit to that question um, of if running um, may be a, a flight response. And I think from my, from my experience, it was. And then kind of the double whammy was it was actually kind of um, culturally, socially approved and applauded. It was like, oh, there's that long distance runner, like, go get him. And it was like, I was known freshman year as runner girl. And I had so much, like, it, it wasn't healthy. Um, and so it was interesting that, yeah, for me, it was like um, easier to take flight. And, and also this question's making me think about this. Also, uh, 
like a felt sense of agency. Like I don't have to stay like locked in my mind or locked in my thoughts, I can run. Um, and so, yes, that was true, but I also needed the support and help to titrate. Like, how do I not go from feeling trapped and kind of stuck in my thoughts to having to run 10, 12 miles to tire myself out? Like, can there be anything in between those two extremes? I, I really like that. Um... And I feel like I'm deferring a lot of these running questions for you to start, Lauren, because of your, because of your history. Um, and I'll just share kind of from my own personal experience too. I, I'm, um, I'm not a runner, but I do really enjoy hiking and, and backpacking. And I actually just got back from a 10 day trip in the high Sierra. Um, and I've had to really like backpacking is so interesting because you're traversing all these miles. You're, it's heavy, you're carrying stuff, but there's so much beautiful nature around that. I really almost like, again, play a game with myself where I'll notice when I'm just like trying to get the miles in, like I'm focused on the next destination. I, I have, and I stop myself. Like I sort of am trying to train myself to notice more, like, can I be resourced within the activity? Can I find resources within the activity versus just like full steam ahead to the outcome? Like I think Kat was saying, um, and I really enjoy that. And I think that's a wonderful practice. And I don't know that this directly answers the question, but I think it's worth mentioning to like, you know, while I'm running or, or for me, we know when I'm out there backpacking, like just to stop and, and to take in the view. And I sort of automatically just begin orienting to my own space um, in the here and now, but to, to let the, the resourcing of the movement or to notice like, how does this feel? Like, do I notice that I'm, that I have a body still, I'm not just this moving like thing that's going on with focus. So I, I think when we can start interjecting that too, um, along with everything else we've talked about, noticing the impulse, visualizing the movement, because it absolutely can be a detrimental habitual pattern, as, as Lauren said. Um, but maybe that's the, the in-between or part of the in-between of it's not just I have to stay here or go run 10 miles. Maybe I can go you know, run two miles and really like take in my environment and have it be a different kind of a, of a run, for example. Yeah, um, Dr. Peter Levine has a quote that I'm not going to be able to quote in its entirety um, in his book, Healing Trauma. And it speaks to exactly what Dr. Alice, you were just saying of how um, our nervous system can't be in a traumatized state if we're exploratory and curious and playful with our attention. You know, and that's the effectiveness of orienting, right? It's inviting us to notice the colors and shapes or lights and textures and just be a bit playful. And each time we do that, we're stepping out of that um, limbic uh, survival zone of fight, flight, freeze, appease. And I just love that of like, yeah, that we can kind of counter our hardwired um, survival strategies, which we very much need, um, but we don't have to stay locked in them. You know, they're there and we can also notice you know, the, the trees and the environment, the shades of light. Yeah, I, I agree with both. It can be a, um, a flight response. And just to reiterate, the noticing the impulse, I think is the really important thing when we're doing sessions um, with, with people with the SE work there might be an impulse to run, but we're not asking them to get up and run. We're asking them to notice the impulse and what happens next. And sometimes the legs are shaking and, or sometimes the feet are moving and it's just staying in this present and noticing what's happening and then orienting to your environment. And sometimes then that is a, you know, what we might call a completion response then and then I'm also thinking, not to get too complicated, but the, but actually, Lauren, you brought it up about overcoupling or having something coupled with this desire to run. And so I, I think it all comes back to noticing the impulse and, and how it feels for yourself. And even to your point, Margaret, of um, inviting the, the pause or pausing and noticing the urge, and if that response is like, no, don't pause me. It's like, oh, we got some healthy aggression online. Like, let's feel this no. 
And that for me was such an aha moment in my own SE work personally and the work I facilitate with folks of um, inviting the no, making space for the no. If I say something and someone doesn't like it, like, let me hear that no. And even practice, you know, not that, well, maybe in some cases we practice saying no, but uh, in that moment, if I'm like, can we pause here? And some of them, no, like, I want to keep going. It's like, can we feel that no, that assertiveness, that agency? Yeah, I'm just going to share a quick little anecdotal story of the no. I have a, a client that we were, you know, working on boundaries, and there's a particular exercise that I have. Um, I introduced and they didn't want to do it. And I was like, okay, well, let, let's just notice what it feels like to tell me no. And then I waited about a month. I tried to introduce, as soon as I started speaking, I could see on their face and I just burst out laughing. I'm like, just tell me no, like say, like really say, no, I'm not going to do that. And we, we still haven't done this activity that I think would be really beneficial, <laughs> but right now we're in the no stage and we're just celebrating the agency to say no so huge. I think that's part of the, it's definitely part of what I, how I like to work with SE is this idea of like, can you feel your yes and your no? And, and coming to like, that's a huge thing right there, just to be able to, as you both said, in, in these um, situations to be able to like, to know what to know, and then to verbalize it and also to feel it. Um, and, and I like with the yes too. And sometimes I'll ask people, and this is such a dumb example, but I'll be like, purple pen or blue pen? And you can't even really see these pens, so I need better objects. Um, but it's it's really like kind of cool to get at like, what is my preference? Like, what do I actually prefer here? Um, and how does that feel in my body? Which is a little bit of a tangent, but I just, I love that so much because it really, it's that integrative quality of coming in and being like in our bodies, which is, you know, pretty great. I think it was a perfect segue because it's like, am I choosing to run or am I running because I have to, or I think I have to, or it's this automatic loop that I can't get out of. So the, the choice, we have choices, right? Yeah. And I'm a bit of a rebel um, sometimes because I know in our, our culture, I think there's even been movies about like saying yes. And I'm like, let's make some space for saying no. Like, you know, I, I get a little prickly when I hear like, oh, just say yes, just allow. And, you know, I'm like, oh, that's like, just stay in the appease um, and please trap for me, at least that's how I experience it. And so just even small exercises, I had to do this for myself, like even um, yet yeah, to Dr. Alice's point, like blue pen or purple pen, do I want a sandwich or a yogurt for lunch instead of just always being in this routine of what is kind of automatic pilot um, of sensing and, and, and in these smaller ways. So um, when it comes to like bigger life moments, there's already a little bit of a support of what a yes feels like versus what a no feels like. And also allowing for, oh, something in me saying yes, something in me is saying no, I'm gonna pause, let both be there, take my time. And even maybe say, oh, hold on, I'm, I'm not ready to make that decision yet, which took a lot of work <laughs> for me to learn how to do to say like, pause, I need a pause. Can I get back to you tomorrow? Yeah, exactly. So healthy. Because there is like people pleasing is a huge thing that um, I work with in my practice. And it's, yeah, to be able to have that agency to say no. And I think we've already said this. I just get really excited about this topic. <sighs> Well, then let's take a related question. <laughs> <laughs> nice. um, I'm, I asked Emily if she would come online and haven't heard back yet. So I want to go to another one. There was a question posted by, um, oh gosh, as soon as I'm typing, they're disappearing. Oh, shoot. There was an anonymous question in there about, um, about chronic pain. So maybe I'll just, I'll pitch it out rather than ask someone to join us, but it might be nice. Someone had a question about working with chronic pain and specifically fibromyalgia and some of your thoughts about movement as it relates to that. It's a really, it's a great question. And I actually noted that question when I glanced briefly. So I'm glad that you pulled it up. Um, 
Chronic pain is tricky, uh, as as you know, as any of us know, um, but specifically someone who's dealing with fibromyalgia. And I think coming back to some of the things that we have touched on already and is, is titration. You know, what can we do in very small increments where you feel maybe 2% better, where maybe the pain is, is 2% better. And same thing with awareness as we start coming into the body. What happens a lot with chronic pain, back to that negative bias that Lauren was, was speaking to, is it becomes our whole world, or it can be, where that's all we focus on is, is that pain. Um, and especially when it's kind of a global body-based pain and it's everywhere, it can just take over our, our minds. And, and pain has a high signal, it travels fast, um, just as far as the nerve fibers. So is there any place in your body where there's slightly less pain? Is there anywhere where there's 2% less pain? Again, it doesn't have to be these huge gradients. Look for the little changes. Um, and then I, I would also just invite, is there, are there already, like we talked about this before, are there already any movements you can do that maybe feel 2% better or where the pain's 2% better? Um, speaking kind of more just from a PT standpoint, I really like for people to get in the water if you can um, and just kind of have some of that buoyancy, take gravity off, movement in water and explore if that's something you enjoy and something you like. And, and it may not be, which is fine. But if it is, when you're in there, like notice what it's like to move in there. Really, again, slow down those movements. How is it to move my arm through the, you know, through the therapy pool or, or through the pool or wherever I am in water and, and give your body that experience as well. So the only experience your body has isn't of this chronic pain. Dr. Alice, I don't have a whole lot to add, except I, I just wanted you to know that we totally had a mind meld because right before you said water, I was like floating. Mm. And, you know, if you don't have access to water there, I, I have, you know, I actually, it's one of my go-to movements, um, either standing or just laying on the floor and imagining that there's no gravity mm. and just move like, just floating like what would it like again i'm a big one with imagination right and there's no gravity i but like that i can feel it right now sorry go ahead yeah and it's slow motion it, it it forces you to to really be slow and just even if it's a sway but imagining that that you're just weightless so yay for water and floating to carry that a bit further, um, something I find helpful for me and is to not use the word pain. Um, I'm also a poet and the word pain just feels so heavy and crushing for me and certainly my experiences with physical chronic pain. So I'll use the word sensation and just kind of noticing the sensations that are here in this moment because pain can just feel unending. It can feel so big and unending, but if I just kind of sense, okay, um, you know, go beneath the label of pain to sensing, oh, it's grippy, it's pulley. And then uh, that language that I, I found when I'm facilitating uh, mindfulness sessions or uh, mindfulness meditation is, you know, the sensations floating through awareness. You know, with, and so that there's, you know, maybe even noticing the space between sensations, you know, right now I had like that um, grippiness, tight tension in my neck and shoulder and jitteriness in my hands. And can I feel, you know, the space between those two areas of just noticing the space, our brain likes to focus and it's hardwired to do so on objects and unpleasant uh, stimuli. So when we invite our mind to, or our, our body mind to notice space, either within our room, like space between the window and the other side of the wall or space between um, a phone and my pens, and also the space between sensations within our bodies, um, that can be really helpful. And again, in that spirit of expanding awareness. So it's not that we're pushing anything away but we're kind of allowing what's here to be here and just giving a larger container, a larger space to hold it all. I love that you just said container because I, I wanted to chime in and talk about this idea of containment. And this is something I started practicing really much more recently. Um, 
is like, can I allow the wholeness of my container to, to, um, I guess to hold like whatever it is I'm feeling so that it's not like I used to get a lot of anxiety and it was right here and it was real sharp and it was hard to focus on anything else. And, you know, can I, can I notice that I have a back body? Even that is really, it, ch it changes kind of your perception, but can I allow, and it's not about trying to move energy or anything like that, but can I allow like all of my being, all of my container to hold whatever it is I'm feeling. So maybe there is more space, like Lauren was just saying. I love that idea of notice the space in between sensations. Um, it's, yeah, great. Or even the edges of sensations. You know, we don't have to plunge fully into the fullness of unpleasantness, just even tracing the edges um, can be another, I like that languaging too, of, you know, so that we don't feel like our attention is just kind of pulled into that vortex. So Dr. Alice, you talked about the back body and um, I could um, offer a little experience of people. Yay. Mind meld, Margaret, mind meld. Cause people are starting to say like, can we experience this? So I'm just gonna interrupt you for a sec, just to say, um, if you haven't, been doing the thing these folks are saying as they've been saying it. Like, let me really put on the court an invitation because I think we can all see these three. I'm like, I'm talking separate from them right now. Here's me in the screen separate from them. Uh, <laughs> you can hear like they're full of physical, physically engaging thoughts and they're excited to talk with each other. That's what these conversation series do. It's like so exciting to start to get to chat with your peers, right? Like I love seeing the three of you come alive, really. Like this is, this is super cool. So, um, so there's, as much as they're talking about, I want to keep inviting you to every time they say, feel into your back or pushing against something, go ahead and be pushing, <laughs> you know, push over here, feel your back. They're talking about containment. Ask yourself what's containment and try something physical right there. Just this is a time to be practicing and being together while they're sharing ideas and concepts. And Margaret will lead us in one in a moment. But before she does, there's two things I want to chime in. One is we have an ex another extraordinary SCP who works in, um, in, in body and fitness work. Her name is uh, Laura Kadari, and she wrote a book called Lifting Heavy Things, Using Strength Training to Support Trauma Healing. So you can look that up on Amazon, and Kiana may, may drop that into the, the text as well of this post of our time together, but she's doing a second part of a webinar with us on August 25th. So you're all welcome to join in the webinar series. They're always really rich and beautiful times together. If you're not a member, you wanna be a member because you get a discounted rate or sometimes free, um, but they're also open to everyone. So you can go to our website on our events page and look for that one on uh, lifting heavy things. And I'd recommend her book. It's actually, it's great. I recently got it. And then uh, if you'd like to speak on one of these panels in the future, like I just discovered these three. I feel like I just invented you and you showed up in my world. I'm just going to indulge that belief. Forgive my overindulgence. But really like getting to know the whole SC universe and like all this incredible resource that is shared among us. We have incredible faculty. Y'all know that the incredible faculty. If you haven't met them yet, go to www.traumahealing.org slash conversations and the first six in the series were our faculty. And then we've been moving into spotlighting our SE community. If you work in some modality, you think we should share or create some public health interest around, you know, I heard you guys stuff earlier, like fitness doesn't sound good, but that's like a kind of generic public health term, you know? So we're really letting folks know in the mainstream sort of conversation of the world that what we understand about nervous systems is important and relevant to topics that are of interest in public health, social vulnerabilities, and, and just in many aspects to help heal the planet. Please keep an eye on the chat where Kiana will be dropping a link to our speakers bureau and you could tell us a little bit about you and the work that you do. Or you can also shoot us an email at publichealth.traumahealing.org where we just sort of take it all in and see who's here and how do we develop future topics. Um, so, so stay with us for that. And also we're, we're supposed to end in about 10 minutes, but we're having a good time. Anybody else? Are we having a good time? I know you want to go home. You want to go? No, you don't. You want to hang out with these guys and you want... You want to do more activities. If you want to do more activities, hang on, because I know Margaret and, and Alice and Lauren, Dr. Alice, all have some cool things to share. So let's get into more experiential stuff if we can. There's cool questions in there about 
kids, there's questions um, about eating disorders. So if you can drop some of that into it, but I'd really like us to get into an experiential place if we can. So people get a better idea of how to apply this work in their own bodies and in their world. So with that said, I'll turn it over to you guys again with huge appreciation for where this is going. And because we're going, we have 10 minutes left. I want to actually ask you, can we go till quarter two the next hour? Would you guys be up for an additional 15 minutes? It's like the secret bonus. That's no longer a bonus on these conversations. It's no longer secret. Anyway, we're going to do 15 more. You guys good? Okay. Awesome. Well, you're welcome to stay on folks and, and please stay with us. And if you'd like to come over for the experiences, go ahead and raise your blue hands and we'll bring some of you over on screen with us as we explain what we'll be doing. Thanks. So this activity um, has many purposes and I was thinking about the fibromyalgia and I was thinking about movement and how if there's a holding in the body, it's not just that, but all the tissues around it can also be held and then how we often think of ourselves as only the front of ourselves. And we all, so it's also relating to this head, brain, heart, and gut. So we're gonna um, experience, I'm gonna just invite you to, I have my heart here, it's three-dimensional. It, this is about the, the size. <laughs> and I'm gonna, I'm gonna invite you to just notice if you can feel the back of your body, you might lean against the back of a chair or even get up and lean against the wall. You could lie on the floor and do this as well. But see if you can, I'm just gonna invite you, can your heart be present in the back of your body? And what happens when you imagine or allow your heart to just be towards the back. Oh, I'm noticing all sorts of sensations in my legs too, but particularly the, a softening in the front of my chest and sort of a, a real um, lengthening. And when you're ready, I'm gonna ask you now to see if you can notice how you feel if your heart is more towards the front of your body. Can it just sort of float like the liquid in a lava lamp towards the front? Without pushing, you might put your hand there, this is a real familiar thing for many of us to do is to place our hand here and then maybe you feel a little more presence in the front. And just see what you notice, what changes happen. And now here's the big invitation when you're ready, can you find a place where maybe you're just 50% presence in the back and 50% presence in the front, right in the center of your chest. And while you're Noticing that, I'll just let you know that our heart actually can move in our chest. It does move, moves every time you breathe. It moves with us every time we change our posture and it moves within itself every time it's circulating that blood and oxygenated, oxygenated blood through our body. And how does it feel how are you when your heart is right in the middle? And if you can't sense that one way or the other, just notice what you can sense.
And I would love to know if anybody has any comments, feedback, a word or two of how that felt. I can feel my, like I've yawned twice already. So just that invitation to slow down and feel like I, I can feel myself settling and, and yeah, just feeling more connected front and back. It was really lovely. Totally feeling my carotid arteries. It's like, mm. oh, there's like, there's the blood coming. It's really interesting. I'm not gonna let make a comment, but I just wanna say that it's like widening your window. It's like the capacity just grew. And so it feels like there's an expansion from the front, the sides, the back, you know, the whole area. And that my breathing changed tremendously it you know it went down deeper and just it's an opening it's a really beautiful way to open the window and increase the capacity so thank you that was beautiful thanks for sharing i i'm inclined to like add to this experience if that feel experiential experience if that is okay with everyone does that work on me if i add an you know, to where we are. Yeah, let me just jump in between and say, you guys see J Jane and Brenda, thanks for joining us on here and like just letting us see your faces and be with you doing this. I know you're all doing this at home. If anyone else wants to join us on screen, just raise your hand and we'll be bringing you over. And, and you, ladies, thanks for coming on and keeping it on, on mute as we do the exercise. And if you guys want to ask for some feedback, like, I mean, we're here to be connected, right? So Nito, so if you want to jump on, go ahead and raise your hand and, and Lauren, sure, take it away. Yeah, just in that spirit of kind of what's been named already and, and growing, uh, expanding the window, I think Jane had shared and growing that capacity, if you like, um, expanding a bit more to include what may feel unpleasant or neutral from this place where we've already expanded our capacity a bit. And it's an invitation, um, no, no pressure to do so. But if you like um, kind of returning, reconnecting to the chair that you're sitting upon or the couch you may be lying down upon, floor you're standing upon, just allowing your body to be just as it is and allowing your breath to be just as it is. Noticing where you feel the support of what you're sitting upon or standing upon, laying down upon. And you might notice if in your experience, there's a feeling of pleasantness However subtle it may be, it doesn't need to be big. It can be small. And just resting your attention upon an area or region. And then maybe bringing into awareness just um, an area that feels a little unpleasant. And just going, tracing the edges a bit. Kind of allowing both the pleasantness, something that's feeling a bit unpleasant to be as it is. And just feeling the space between those two areas or sensations. And even noticing something that's neutral in your experience right now, either pleasant or unpleasant. Just feeling that capacity, that aliveness of awareness, of presence, and just allowing what's here to be here. And when you're ready, if your eyes have closed, um, you know, inviting you to open them at when it feels right, you know, and allowing the body to make any movements it may want to make. 
And I felt called to offer that after Margaret's exercise and kind of what I spoke to earlier about sensations floating through awareness or it's kind of noticing and allowing something feeling pleasant and unpleasant. So I know that may have been a bit more meditative than movement oriented, um, but I hope there was something that could be taken away from that. And I'm happy to share um, kind of more of a movement oriented exercise. Ami, I don't know if you want to jump in in between or if we want to get more feedback from folks before I do that. Okay. So whatever, whatever feels right, right to y'all. I just want to acknowledge the folks who have come on screen with gratitude. You're assigned to us of everyone who's with us. We have hundreds with us and it's just nice to see you here and share this space. So thanks for it's really nice to see anybody else wants faces. to yeah right if anyone else wants to come on just raise your hand the thing at the bottom of your screen and we'll just bring you over it's always a little weird when folks pop on and stuff but it's it's nice to you yeah it feels nice like we're all part of the same community and it really does give you that sense with being able to see the faces that um, it's just i love essie so much it's so wonderful to be a part of the community um Okay, so for a little movement exercise, I'm standing here and I would invite, if people would like to, to stand up. If you don't want to, that's fine. Um, I'm gonna try to angle my screen down. I think you're just gonna see my desk and my notes. So we'll just kind of walk through it. But I've, the invitation is we're gonna experiment with moving our hips in a circle. And so I'm gonna invite you, you know, kind of physiologically, you can stand with your hips or your feet a little wider than hip width apart. Kind of, you can take a few movements, see what feels good, little bend in the knees, maybe just a little gentle tuck of the, the pelvis, nothing extreme. Sort of see if you can let yourself rest on your structure in this position. And Qigong, um, a similar position is called like the horse stance. And so it's designed really where we can, we can almost rest on our structure here. And if anything feels uncomfortable, please don't do it. I trust all of you can um, take really good care of yourselves. And, and like we've been talking about, just listen to your body. And so the invitation is really to just draw a circle with our hips and notice really the, the weight shifting in your feet, even though we're moving our hips, it's just bring our attention to our feet. And you can put your hands wherever it feels comfortable. You can bring them to your hips. You can float them around, whatever feels good. You can stretch them up. Um, it's kind of nice to have them on your hips. I think it's, it helps to bring the attention to this area and find the, the circle speed and cadence that works well for you. That feels like how your body wants to move and just bring your awareness and attention to your feet on the ground. How are your feet moving as your hips move? You can notice the different parts of your feet that come into contact with the floor. Just noticing and you can continue to notice your feet, but also bring your attention up towards your knees and just notice what's happening in your knees. Being present with the movement of your knees and your feet. And then just bringing our awareness up to our, our hips and our pelvic bowl. And again, if any of this feels uncomfortable, take care of yourselves. But notice the, the, the bowl like of our, of our pelvis and of our bones there and how we're, we're just moving around. Like Margaret said earlier, our bodies and our bones and all of our structures are designed to move. So just check out what's happening in your hips. You can notice the muscles that overlay those bones, maybe you almost get a little bit of a stretch. If you want to switch direction, maybe check that out, see what it's like to go the other way. And notice if you can just stay present through the movement and find whatever speed that is for you. I tend to find moving slowly, I can keep a bit more presence and awareness than just kind of doing a, a patterned movement. Notice what happens as your hips go back, the connection of your, your tailbone to your pelvis, your spine to your pelvis. Notice what it's like to stretch forward a little and side to side. And then just check in again with your knees and your feet. 
and really just see how, how it feels. Is this pleasant? Is it unpleasant? Are there parts of it? Are there parts of the circle you like more than others? Are there other movements your body wants to go into now? I notice um, Orit is kind of bringing the circle up to her torso and neck. And so, you know, as we kind of bring this exercise to a close, I'll go ahead and invite you to what to move the way your body wants to. How else does your body want to move? And if it's just continuing that circle, wonderful. If there's other movements that want to come in, wonderful. And see if you can stay present with the movements, whatever they are. Maybe just continuing to move slowly, continuing to notice your feet and your knees, your hips, your abdomen. And just to go ahead and take any more movements that you'd like to and maybe zoom out just a little bit and see if you can feel your body as a whole. I almost like bringing my my arms up and like I do a lot of qigong too and imagining this river of chi or life force energy sort of coming down and surrounding me so if that visualization works for you you're you're welcome to it but even just the idea it's almost like coming into that containment and inviting ourselves to fully inhabit our bodies and just to be aware of our bodies as a whole as the front and the back and the feet and the knees and the hips any movement that feels good for you. Let your body just explore again, being curious and playful and stretching if that's what you need. But just see if it can be internally directed versus falling back onto something that's habitual. And when you're ready, you can kind of slow down. You can, you're welcome to come back to sitting or stay standing. But take a moment too, as you, whenever it feels right for you, as you end the movement, just to notice what is it like to come back to stillness. Thanks, that felt good. Yeah, it reminded me of, I used to teach kindergarten um, and it's like, oh my gosh, kids know their bodies, you know, like they are moving, they are embodied. And um, it reminds me of a joke I heard where a woman was an art professor and she told her child, um, cause her child asked mom, what do you do? And she said, well, I'm, you know, professor of art, um, I teach, college students about art and her little daughter responded you mean they forgot like <laughs> and it's like that's what came up in this movement practice of like oh yeah just letting the body move how it wants to move with playful curiosity one of the quotes that i wrote down as we started today was we don't stop playing because we grow old we grow old because we stop playing I think that really speaks to that point of just, again, coming back and remembering who we are and how our bodies want to move is, is so precious. Yeah, something I used to share with clients when I worked in the Pilates studio um, was that, you know, it's not I lead and you follow, it's I offer and you decide. Yeah, um, just... Really, really special. This is really nice. Um, I think we could and maybe even should take some views from, from all of you who joined us. It's so fun seeing more of you. Thanks for coming on with us. It's really, really neat. Um, and I want to name something that happened in today's time together, which is that we got so excited about some of our terms that those of us who have studied somatic experiencing professionally know that folks who have not are like, I don't know what global high activation is. Is it collective trauma? What is activation? I think we've been using a lot of jargon. I think we've done it. And so I just want to name that with some apologies and regrets to those of you who 
are like, what are these folks talking about? And if anyway, a lot, a lot of it is sort of intuitive as you start to come towards this work, you're like, oh, I think I'm tracking what they're saying. I think I'm, I'm getting it a little bit more, but if you are someone who works with people one-on-one -on -one or in groups, or as you can see from these extraordinary professions, from dance teacher and professor to physical therapist to mindfulness coach, like all of the a Pilates instructor, um, if taking the SE training is of interest to you, please check out traumahealing.org and you can learn a bit more about these. There is a basics. There's like a three hour basics that's led not by faculty, but by other SEPs. As part of my thank you for having you guys come today, um, we can see the registration list of who registered and who attended. If you would like free basics, please email us. So take this down real quick. You won't want to miss this one. Public health at traumahealing.org and write that I would like access to your next free basics. And Kiana will get back to you. She'll let you know, you know, there's a link to our calendar as to when they happen. You sign up and we'll get you a one-time use code for you to be able to sign up for that for free. Cause I'd love for you to get as obviously as excited as we are about this kind of work. And, and there's so many cool books and it's just, it's more and more growing in the world. So we're so enthusiastic to be a part of that with you. And also when we talk about activation, I feel like I'd be irresponsible to not name that. You know, we all have this autotomic nervous system that's comprised of parasympathetic and sympathetic components. Um, think uh, one makes me inhale, one makes me exhale. One has my heart constrict and one has it unconstrict. So your nervous system is always activated as long as you are alive. <laughs> so we are all activated. But I think in this group, when we talk about activated, we might be referring to when you feel a little bit more charge or that, you know, whether it's gone all the way high to extreme anxiety or just like a little bit more intensity than what you want in life or a little bit less access to movement because your sympathetic parasympathetic slowdown is on, is engaged. You can learn a lot more about that at the basics. If you don't know what those mean. So I invite you to join us and please forgive us if it was irresponsible to just kind of geek out on it with, with us. Oh my gosh. Speaking of geeks, you got to check out Thayer and Bert's uh, Instagram trauma nerds. If nobody knows about it yet, it's really fun. They're doing like the trauma of comic book characters and they don't know I'm plugging this right now, but I just think it's really cool. You should check that one out. Um, so those are some of the last things I wanted to leave you with. If you have more questions than what got answered in our time together today. Again, please feel free to email Kiana and myself and our team at publichealth.traumahealing.org. It's extraordinary and amazing to be with you all. And I think because we just have two minutes left, I know we could all weigh in about how that exercise was and it would open up extraordinarily. I want to invite you to do one thing. If you did those exercises with us on screen or not, contact someone else and try and share with them what you just learned. Because the whole beauty of SE is while it's deep, complex, intricate, it's also bottom up and accessible. Like it's empowerment, man. Like this is learning your way around your body. So try and share a little bit with someone else. At this moment in history, we, we can be resources to each other. You know, don't worry about messing up. <laughs> Just get out there and get engaged with others, get connected, get involved. And for those of you who are on the line, I want to invite one of you, one of you guys who's on the screen with us with your camera on right now. Would you help me give some appreciation to Lauren and Dr. Alice and Margaret for what they've given us today? Because I can thank them. Y'all hear my voice too much. Would you guys want to jump on and kind of thank them for me and acknowledge them for what they've provided for us? Go for it. Thank you. This was lovely. And thank you so much. My dog enjoyed it too. <laughs> it's wonderful to connect and hear all your suggestions and thoughts. And I just want to add that I think animals are really wonderful at helping us know what's happening in our bodies. Um, I'm a horseback rider. I, I have my dogs as my co-therapists and they tell me more about what's going on inside my clients mm -hmm. than my clients are even aware of. So it's just a thought to kind of think about how we can co-regulate with our animals and it's really powerful. I just, that's my view. We'll get another SE communications series because I'm working on the global high activation on a little foster puppy right now. Anybody else using SE principles with animals, whether as for your clients or on the animals themselves, right? So um, yeah, thank you, Jane. Anybody else want to share anything? Just to say thank you. 
Yeah, it was very, very interesting and relaxing. I haven't uh, recognized that I had so much tense in my body until we started uh, practicing. Yeah, and I want to say thank you to just the language. I know you said you got it, got ahead of you know with the language, but the language is also relaxing, and um, just and it gives you the invitation to free yourself a little bit. So thank you, and I and I I don't know I've been disconnected for a while, but I hope as we go into another season of possible lockdowns across the nation that we'll have more of these conversations. For sure. Were these conversations and dance parties together? Anybody? I mean, movement, come on, let's do some like actual, like get, really get down and like just explore a lot of energy, a little bit of energy, slow-mo, fast-mo. Thanks, Barbara. Anyone else has anything to share? We can say that and otherwise. Otherwise, I think we're just here together. We're here together and it's magnificent. We know that there's grief and pain and suffering and all that is real. And simultaneously, so is connection, so is balance, so is exploring part of the body feels intense, part of the body feels nice. Okay. Welcome to the world where you are a guest and also a host and your body, the vehicle to, to deliver that from. Thank you everybody for being with us today. Oh, oh, I'd also be remiss without letting you know, traumahealing.org is our website. And on there, if you are not a practitioner, but you would like to find one to work with, there's a practitioner directory. We recently redid our website. You have to click on, uh, I think it's resources and research. And the first thing that comes up is the practitioner directory. And you can look for people in your state, which is one way. If you're looking for a licensed mental health provider, usually they're confined to their state where their licenses are are in place, but there are all different kinds of coaches and dance and movement professionals, and, and they may not have the same limitations. And aren't we all figuring out how to do this on Zoom? So we're everywhere. We're everywhere. And we're with you. And there's help in your corner, on your team, and people who care. Any of this panelists want to close this out? Thank you so much to you. I, you know, I just appreciate you beyond measure right now. This has been so fun. Like this, this everyone. Fun. Ditto. Thank you so much. Thank you all been really wonderful see you next time first second friday of every month noon mountain time till then be well be embodied <laughs> yeah.